Hello, I'm Stephanie Ricker Schulte. I'm an Associate Dean in Fulbright College of Arts and Sciences. I'm here at the Fulbright Peace Fountain on our beautiful campus. And I'm especially happy to be here as an Arkansan and as a Fulbright scholar. I was very proud to represent the state and the Fulbright Institute and support its mission of peace through education. I continue to carry that banner here as I research and teach and lead on campus. And it makes me very optimistic about our future. All right, well, good afternoon. How is everyone today? We're doing well. It's Friday, it's 3.30. We are ready for the social in a little while, is that correct? Um, well, welcome to Denver. My name is uh, Eric Diolson, and I'm from a Metropolitan State University of Denver. Uh, we're a public institution just located about five blocks from here in downtown Denver, so I had a very tough commute this morning, let me tell you. Um, welcome to our beautiful city and our, our beautiful state uh, uh, on this very warm autumn day. Uh, but that's the time of the year, so I do hope you have the chance to kind of walk around our, our great city. Uh, so I had the uh, chance to do a Fulbright uh, this past uh, spring semester, and I was in Hanoi, uh, Vietnam, and at a university called Vinh University. And I was very lucky that my partner, my same-sex partner, Van, was able to come with me. And he works um, in industry, and he received some support from his company that he could work, work out, uh, remotely during the time. Uh, that we were there. And what was interesting was we actually had, um, he's actually from Vietnam, and he's been in the United States for about the last 15 years. So, so when I started to do some research on what it's like to kind of navigate going through the Fulbright process and, and going to another country as a same-sex couple, uh, Fulbright has some resources that are actually out there, but I, I was hoping to find some more resources um, to kind of help us kind of navigate, you know, some of the challenges and, and triumphs of, of going, to, uh, uh, going to Vietnam as a same-sex couple. So the purpose of uh, my story is to highlight kind of my experiences and some of my challenges while, while going through this experience. And, and I do have a quiz at the end, so I do hope you take some notes. I'm, I'm just kidding there. <laughs> Um, I, I always knew, my, my field is actually hospitality and tourism, and I always knew that I wanted to do my Fulbright in Southeast Asia. Uh, Southeast Asia is a hot spot for tourism, even before COVID. There's a lot of innovation and infrastructure, new attractions, new destinations, uh, new airports um, in that area. So I always wanted to do my Fulbright experience in that part of the world. And several years ago, I did reach out to the top hospitality programs um, in Southeast Asia. And Vin University in Hanoi was actually the first one to actually respond. And I had a couple conversations with the provost, the dean, and, and a few other faculty members. Uh, Vin University is a private, uh, not-for-profit university. This is their fourth year of operation. And they receive uh, funding from Vin Corporation. Has anyone heard of Vin Corporation, they're a huge conglomerate uh, um, in uh, Vietnam, and you will be hearing a lot about them in the next couple of years. They just started selling their motorcycles and their cars in California. And um, uh, Vin Uni is actually uh, backed by, um, uh, by Cornell from the academic uh, sense there. So I was located in the College of Business and Management and just had an absolutely uh, a fantastic time. Um, I will state that the facilities are among the most beautiful I've ever seen on any university in terms of um, there's a rose garden and, and Greek, Greek uh, uh, statues and a lot of really interesting uh, collaborative uh, uh, spaces. Um, so I'm actually setting up this story as a research project and I will be submitting this to one of my uh, academic journals um, later on this fall. So I'm kind of treating this as more of a kind of a, a research presentation, so to speak. So the major theory that's kind of guiding my story that I'm presenting to you today is actually uh, role theory. And role theory is from sociology and psychology that kind of states that we have multiple different roles and responsibilities in our daily lives and how we interact um, with a wide variety of stakeholders. And as a result of those uh, uh, you know, roles and stakeholders that we interact with, there's different vocabulary, terms, norms, values that we actually have. So during my Fulbright, I had a wide variety of different roles, which we all did. I was a professor, I was an educator, I was a researcher, I was a tourist, um, I was a partner, I was a friend, I was a family member, kind of during my actual uh, um, experience. And then I did want to kind of just talk very briefly about, you know, the, kind of the status of LGBTQ rights uh, in Vietnam. Um, I would say Vietnam is a conservative country. But there's been a lot of progress in just in the last couple of years in this area. I just saw a poll a couple of weeks ago that about 60% uh, of Vietnamese do support same-sex marriage. So probably where the United States was maybe about 10, 12 years ago, that was kind of my, my assessment. 
uh, in 2014, they did abolish um, a ban on same-sex marriage, which ultimately could pave the way for same-sex marriage in, in the future. Uh, but there's a huge hospitality ecosystem of bars and cafes and tour guides and destinations uh, targeting the LGBTQ plus uh, uh, tours. Um, I did want to kind of state my posi positionality statement because this does kind of guide my story and ultimately my research project. Um, I do identify as a cisgender uh, gay male who is white. Uh, my partner is a cisgender gay male um, who is Asian. Uh, we've been in a relationship for about the last nine years. As I stated, my partner did grow up in Vietnam but has been in the United States for the last 15 years. And both of us are out uh, to our family and to our, our work environment. So this kind of guides kind of my, my project and my lived in um, experiences uh, in Vietnam. So from a method perspective, this is kind of in the qualitary, qualitative um, inquiry, uh, very much kind of an autoethnographic approach where I'm kind of, you know, examining my experiences while being on my Fulbright in Vietnam. And from a data perspective, my data kind of comes from, from my, my data, photographs and video, my, my uh, uh, tourism itineraries, um, I'll, and I did keep a journal to kind of record my thoughts and, and feelings about my experience uh, during that time. So I just want to present to you kind of three major themes that are kind of emerging from my reflection. Again, I got back in June, so, so my experience is kind of, you know, in the last uh, reflection in the last four, four months or so. The first theme is kind of this idea of cultural sharing and understanding. And in my relationship, I'm usually the one who deals with all the travel and the travel planning because that is my field. But in Vietnam, our roles were actually reversed. So in other words, my partner Van, because he speaks the language, he knows the norms, he knows the, the culture, kind of took that, that, that role, and that was actually very fun. So I was very fortunate that it had a very positive experience meeting several of his family, uh, several of his friends. Uh, we were able to celebrate some of the holidays, such as Tet, Lunar New Year, together um, in that environment. And here's just a picture of Van um, at the Museum of Ethnology, uh, which is in uh, Hanoi. Uh, Vietnam has uh, 54 cultural identities, so it's a fun museum to kind of see um, all the different uh, cultural um, um, identities uh, that make up in, uh, Vietnam. My second theme kind of talks a little bit about this idea of the coming out process, or navigating the coming out process, which is the sharing of one's identity uh, uh, with others. Researchers have stated that this is a very complex process. Um, I have seen that this or could be interpreted as a five-stage process. I've also seen that it's kind of a dichotomy, but I, I think that you know, for many members of the community, it's a much more complex process. In other words, I may be out to some of my, in part, some of my roles and not, not others. So I may be out to my friends, but not my family, or I may be out at work and not in my, my, my private life. So I think that's, it can be a very complex uh, a process. And for many members of the community, we often rely on signs and symbols in that environment to help us make that determination, you know, and my comfort level um, in terms of sharing my identity with others. Uh, I was very fortunate uh, that during my experience, um, I shared my identity with, with, with the most stakeholders. Um, I found, I did teach a couple classes in Vietnam and I found students are very interested in, in you know, learning more about the LGBTQ plus community. Um, several administrators at my school in Ben Uni were out, and uh, even uh, Ben Uni actually had a, a student uh, resource uh, a group for members of the LGBTQ plus community. So in that regard, I was very fortunate because I do know not all folks who do go on the Fulbright have that experience. And here's just a, a picture um, of, of me and my partner Van and his family um, in Halong Bay, which is what the number or one of the number one uh, 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 tourist attractions. And the lastly, kind of my third theme here um, is this idea of a congruency of core values. I think most couples, they have shared values, and during our experience, I think our, our values, what we deem important as a couple, uh, were only strengthened. So the importance of family, the importance of friends, the importance of education, uh, the importance of you know, being out and sharing our experiences with others, um, th those values uh, were really uh, important for us. And here's just a picture of, of us in um, Hoi An. So just in summary, um, I just want to kind of share my, my story about my experience uh, going through Vietnam. 
Um, I, I do think um, you know, LGBTQ plus uh, individuals as well as couples often face challenges while going through this, this process. There are some resources that are actually out there and, and I hope to provide some additional ones in the future. So uh, thank you very much, I really appreciate it and I will see you around uh, at the conference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. Next up, we have Judy Shepard, who's gonna talk about her time in Uganda. Okay, can you guys hear me okay? This is exciting. Um, I'm very happy to be here and I, I'm excited about the story that I'm sharing um, because I was involved of uh, forming a community grassroots group in rural southwestern Uganda, a totally different environment than uh, the last presenter spoke about. Um, but I, I love to share this story, and this is the first time I've done it in a, a big public group because it's really um, in the times of all this incredibly depressing and hard news. Uh, it's joyful and it's it's a it's filled with hope and I'm working with secondary school students who just have all kinds of career ideas so how I want to start is this is a totally uh, Fulbright appreciation from me I went to Uganda first in 2012 2013 as a senior Fulbright scholar then my grant was extended for a second year. Then I stayed a third year just to continue to teach there. I taught in the social work program at Uganda Christian University, which is an Anglican school. And I have gone back every year except for the pandemic. Um, and I just came back six days ago from a six week Fulbright specialist there. So I'm still doing a little jet lag. But this is the picture of my very first visit to Uganda, or to the, to the community, Katovu, in southwestern Uganda. So in my first class, like two weeks in country, I came in August and September, I was teaching a cl two classes with 120 students and 140 students, and I had class leaders. And so cl the, my class leader in one of the big classes was a young man named Peter Chitayimbwa, who's in the blue shirt, and he immediately, very smartly, natural community organizer, asked me, if he could talk to me about a group that he wanted to start in his village. And where he lives is close, kind of close to the Congo border, it's in a dry corridor, but at the time it had an HIV AIDS prevalence rate of 19%, and it was a dry corridor, so a lot of uh, food insecurity, and many, many widows and orphans. Um, his father died of HIV AIDS when he was 12. He was a sponsored kid since he was nine. Um, only one in his family that spoke English. So he invited me to come visit, and I said, sure, because I didn't know it was a three-hour drive on bad roads at the time. But um, he had the whole day planned, and it was wonderful. We visited the water source, which was a cow pond, where kids were dipping in their jerry cans. We, visited, we looked at the government school, which was horrific. We visited the church. We visited his mom. We visited the Compassion International Program. Um, and the, so there's what I want to point out in this picture is there's four people in this picture, and we became the board of this grassroots community-based organization, which has turned into a big, very accepted NGO in the community. So it was made up of Peter, me, Peter Chitayimbwa, who was 22 at the time, and the person on the far right and the person on the far left who weren't from the community, but they had been working in the community for a long time. So I was really the only outsider and the only old person. And after I visited, I said, sure, I'll help. And I was planning on just helping with um, getting sponsors to support critically vulnerable kids in school. Um, so our first group, we went with that first, and our first group of kids are in this picture. There were about 15 kids, and they were all interviewed with the families and guardians, whether they would still you know, help and support the education and come to activity days. All the kids were wormed, all the kids were checked for HIV AIDS, all of their school supplies were given. They, um, we, we did wraparound services, home visits. So this program is still going today. Now we have about 90 kids and they're sponsored in primary, secondary, and at the university level. Okay, now let me get the next one. Oops. Okay, 
So this is uh, right at the beginning, and the four of us stayed together as a board for nine years. So this is an incredibly non-traditional board, um, but we were all an active board, and everybody kind of had roles, and we had a lot of fun doing this. We only changed, this, the, the program is still going, which is amazing. We only changed after the pandemic and got a more traditional local board that was elected, but the, nine, the, the four of us hung together for nine years and really worked very well and had a very enjoyable process. So this is our first little office, and this is the primary school where we sent the first group of kids, where we still send the kids, and we still have this office, but we have more. And you notice we all have matching shirts. That was like right away, we all got shirts with an insignia, we had a web page, we had matching keychains. Uh, it was a good start, it was a good start. And the community loved the program. Where's my tech? Per oh, there we go. Wait, let me show. Okay. Oops. All right, I have to go back. Sorry, hang with me a minute. All right, so we started that, sc that school sponsorship program in January of 2013. We, st we started, I went out the first time in October 2012. By 2014, the other board members decided we needed a microcredit project to help the widows and the orphan in the, in the community so that they could support some of the other kids in school and they could buy food for their families because we could only support one, maybe two at most of a family's kids. Um, so this is some pictures of our microcredit groups. And I just want to say that all of our donations have been individual. We have no church donations, no business donations, no corporate donations. I do a lot of GoFundMes. When they wanted to start the microcredit group, I was a Fulbright. So I got my, I used to live in Alaska. I had my Alaska permanent dividend fund. So I just donated it. And what an easy thing to do, but the money rotates. So that kept this group going with the microcredit group. We've gotten some more money added, but we've had over 100 women go through it. Wonderful projects where people work together pig raising. I've seen one time I was there, a group was working together to build a pit latrine for one of the women that didn't even have a pit latrine. So this has been another really very good project and very well respected and liked in the community. And then this is the big one. This is the real changing one that got us on the, uh, got us on people's radar was, again, the board members from that region, you know, the other three, came to one of our little board meetings and said, we need a secondary school. And I said, as an American, uh, I don't think so, because I'm thinking liability, fundraising, all of the stuff that goes with the secondary school, which is huge. Um, but at that time, the stats were for kids graduating from secondary school in that district, 2% of the kids graduated from secondary school. That's because the only secondary school was a government school eight and a half miles away. There was no transport. So that also meant none of the kids, most of the people, when I go there to this day, I have to have a translator because you learn English in secondary school. And when you learn English, it increases where you can get jobs. So I, I said, okay, I'm in again. And so they started looking for land, and Peter called me one day and said, I got the perfect land, which it was, 10 acres of, on a hill uh, overlooking right at the edge of the town. And I was like, I don't know where we're going to get this money. But amazingly, I got a person to donate, an old friend from way back in college, donated the money. And here's a good lesson for all of us. When I was on my Fulbright Specialist these last few weeks, we just got the land title cleared. It took nine years, but the land is completely in our name now. It's become very valuable, actually. But our land didn't have any buildings on it, but it had 17 anthills. So what you see here are either anthills or termite mounds, which everybody was excited about because with the women came out, the widows who had children sponsored in the program, and took down those anthills, which is not easy because there's trees in them and everything. Some grandpas came, and people were so excited to have a secondary school. But out of that dirt from those anthills, we made something like 70,000 bricks on the property, and we had a kiln on the property, and then you can see on the side, all the labor was done by hand, and that's our first main classroom block that was going up 
And what else I like about that pro this, pro this slide is you can see the four board members again. So we, we hung around, because I was there three years, we hung around a lot together and got to see the project growing, which was very exciting. But everything was done by hand, all the building. So this is the building completed, and this is when we first opened it as a secondary school. And we started with about 60 senior one and two kids, which is junior high. And every year that those kids would move up, we would add another class that we needed. So today we have 570 kids enrolled, and we have a, all the O levels, all the A levels, a science track, a science lab. And honestly, all of this was funded through GoFundMes and appeals to donors on our Facebook page and Peter spending some time in the US. But the pride for this was just absolutely amazing. And you can see a classroom there in the grounds a little bit later. Oh, okay. That's, you, okay, I gotta go fast because the next, uh, the last two slides are the best. So basically we never expanded nationally like getting all over the, st over the country. We never went international, but we kept adding things that were important to the community in that school. So very quickly, because I'm out of time, this is during the pandemic. I wanted to showcase this because all the schools were shut for two years. So people were really struggling. So we did food giveaways because we still had money from donors. And we did a darling uh, distance ed program where the teachers got together and gave assignments and we dropped them off in different points and villages and the kids got airtime that they could call up their teachers and get feedback. And then this is our science lab and we have a, health, a little health clinic which isn't a um, registered health clinic but it's accepted by the country because we use it as a referral and we taste, test for HIV AIDS, we test for malaria, we test for pregnancy and then we can counsel and refer the kids and the nurse lives on campus so she's there full time. Oh, and that other picture was our first grant from the US Embassy for a civic engagement project which was so exciting with Michigan State. This is every year at Christmas, we give the kids who are sponsored a gift. So one year they got mattresses, last year they got shoes. And these are 10 water tanks that Peter raised money from for donors so that we got through the dry season this year without having to shut down when the other schools had to close two weeks early. So that was a real boon. And, and this is, okay, I gotta do this one. This is our 10 year anniversary, exactly 10 years from that first visit, from that first slide that you all saw. This is our traditional dance group, our choir. You can see there's more buildings. There's like seven of these buildings with blue roofs. All the kids' parents and guardians and family members came. We had about 1,500 people. We fed them all. Two members of parliament, the bishop, lots of speeches. But the, oh, and I love this, the picture of the band marching through the community, advertising for everybody. And so you can see the community pride was so important. And the last slide, this building is the first building that we put up that you saw, only now we've got it landscaped. We've got a vegetable garden so that we can feed kids with our vegetables, two cows. And then there's a picture of Peter and I still together 11 years later, older and fatter, and I'm talking about the values of an education. And the bottom one is the best because that's back at Uganda Christian University where I taught with three of our kids that are now going to school there fully sponsored, and five of our graduates won government scholarships to go to uh, McCary and Embraer University. So as I said, when I go there, this is like my happy place because you can see change and you can see hope and kids are majoring in pre-med and nursing and computer science and nutrition and talking about returning to their community. So that's the story. All right, all right. So hi, my name is Kathleen. I'm from Cornell University uh, in the Department of Microbiology. So yes, I'm a microbiologist, I'm a scientist, I like to be on, in the lab, and I'm gonna tell you my Fulbright story. I thought I'd put on my cover slide this uh, picture of uh, sustainable development goals because I think that's what prompted me to apply for a uh, Fulbright scholarship in the first place. I was always thinking about these things, and of course, being in the lab, it's sometimes hard to realize uh, your work, uh, you know, in a, in a broader sense, in a, in a global sense. And so, uh, let's see if I can move this forward. 
No. Oh, okay, figured it out. So um, just to start with, I've, I was a, uh, at the time working on a project that involved uh, protein engineering of cellulases. Cellulases are uh, enzymes that microbes produce that help break down plant matter. They break down plant cell walls. We can actually use cellulases for many purposes, including making biofuels. So that's what I was doing at Cornell when I applied for my uh, Fulbright. And I'm just bringing this up. I think this is nothing new for you. You probably already know it. The food sector alone accounts for about 30% of the world's total energy consumption and about just over or just under a quarter of greenhouse gas emissions. So it's really bad news the way we produce our food today. And at the same time, Oh, point back there. There we go. We, we, we uh, create over a billion tons of food wasted every year. And already there's lots of people who are undernourished and going hungry, uh, malnourished. So some of this food, food waste that we have in you know, the, the global north, so we, so we could call it, uh, could just be you know, stuff we throw out in our, our garbage and we never use or you know, gets, goes bad in a refrigerator. But when you're talking about the global south, you're talking about other things. So, so the pictures I'm showing you are hard, you know, just wheat that's uh, gone bad here. And that's more of a policy issue more than anything else, I think. Or even it doesn't even get packed, you know, the, the food doesn't even get packed away. In some countries we have food that doesn't even get taken out of the field and it's going bad. So there's just all kinds of ways that there's food waste and it's the food waste in developing countries tends to be different than what we see here. So, uh, oh, point over here. There we go. So I decided to apply uh, to be the uh, research chair in uh, global food insecurity for uh, the University of Guelph. University of Guelph is in Canada, it's in Ontario. It's probably about four hours drive from uh, Cornell University. It's uh, also a big egg school, so they have a vet school, they have a big agriculture program. It's quite similar to Cornell in a lot of ways. And I was really interested in exploring this food waste problem. I had been working with these cellulases, as I told you, in the lab, so I wanted to develop a project and that's what I applied for with my Fulbright. And these were the objectives of my project that I, I wrote in my application. I wanted to produce this, re, uh, generate a reproducible cellulose degradation system. And I was able to do this in plants, so making uh, uh, cellulases, producing them in plants. This was uh, something I published later, so I was very happy to have that opportunity uh, with, through the Fulbright to do this. I also wanted to explore whether I could um, make energy from food waste for the cost being less to almost nothing. And I thought I could do this by making these cellulases in plants. And that's what I explored. And my, my big take home from doing the Fulbright is I was given that opportunity for months to not have to do anything else but focus on this project. And so I was able to move forward in leaps and bounds. Usually as an academic, you're just pulled in every direction, teaching classes and running committees and things like this. And this just gave me total focus for a period of time and I was able to really move forward with this. So uh, just to give you a brief, you know, nothing too scientific here or too heavy in the science, you can see here I was able to make cellulases in plants, so they're, they're microbial things, but I was producing them in plants. I could make them into a powder or into some kind of slurry and I could break down what we call recalcitrant lignocellulosic uh, biomass. And this is what we see when we're looking at, at plant cell walls in general. So we tend to think of biofuel as something we get from corn, when, and we make bioethanol, or we make uh, um, you know, some kind of diesel fuel. We talk about that sort of thing. So this is a little different. This is where we're using uh, uh, plant residual waste. So this is like the, the husks of corn or uh, the straw of, uh, of rice, you know, these sorts of things that nobody has any use for, animals don't eat it, this sort of thing. Okay. And I, I put this slide just to remind you that, there, that there's a, a, a very strong association between energy security and food insecurity. So, you know, when the prices of our energy um, sources, our fuels go up, 
the prices of our food go up. And that's because, you know, we're, we're, we're growing corn, for example, and some of it's being used for energy and some of it's being used for food. So the idea here was to break this link of this chain. You know, could we not make, you know, use plants but not make them be uh, uh, food crops, things that we're eating for food? All right. So um, after I came back from my uh, Fulbright, I managed to get a travel grant and I went to rural Botswana and I was doing a research project there. I'm just pointing this out in case some people don't know where that is. And uh, let's see. I'm trying to turn it, sorry. Oops. And so what I found is that, uh, you know, there's a lot of food insecurity in sub-Saharan Africa. I mean, that's no surprise. And it really got me thinking, and it actually changed my focus, or I would say broadened my focus, about what I was doing with with these uh, cellulases and biofuel. And I started to think about, you know, how are we going to feed a global population? We probably have, uh, I think last year at this time, we had 8 billion people on the planet. You know, we're, we're working towards 10 billion people. We're not pe feeding people down there in sub-Saharan Africa very well at all. And I also noticed a shift in consumer behavior towards plant-based foods. So I started to think about the technology I had developed and I thought, well, we could change, or we must change, the way we're producing our food, especially how we are generating our protein. So this led me to decide to start and co-found a company, and the company is Forte Protein. And so I was able to get going on this and uh, apply for funding in various sources, find uh, um, angel investors and venture capitalists, and uh, form a team. And the next thing you knew, we were moving forward. So our mission is we develop uh, animal proteins in plants, and we can do this in a very sustainable way. And our broader mission, and this is what you know, I, I would really like to do, is uh, make proteins accessible and affordable to reduce protein deficiency in malnourished communities around the globe. And that's my, my long-term goal. So uh, just to give you an idea of, thank you, of, of how this can change uh, the way uh, we're thinking about our food uh, system. I told you before about greenhouse gas emissions, and I'm just showing you some uh, proteins here that we're very familiar with, so cheese proteins. You can see that the carbon footprint is 10.87 kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of uh, cheese that we make. And here, if we make these same proteins in plants, it's just one kilogram CO2 per kilogram of uh, protein we make. So you can see we can really reduce our carbon footprint by making some of these animal proteins in plants. And that, was, that is the plan of this company. So this was a, a photo uh, that I took this summer. This is my group and we were, um, so I've you know, taken on employees. I have, I've, I'm growing larger and larger all the time. We're housed right now at Cornell University. This is a center for life science ventures. We're moving and uh, expanding uh, very, very quickly. And it's really looking great. So I've been uh, uh, really happy that this uh, Fulbright uh, led me to come up with a technology that could pivot and uh, do something really substantial. And I think it really will. So thank you very much. Everybody, can you hear me? No? How about that? Thank you, everybody, especially the University of Arkansas, for your support for this plenary. I have one slide. I spoke with my middle schooler earlier this afternoon, and I said, tell me how to get this right. And he said three things. He said, keep it simple, stick to the script, and don't tell any jokes. <laughs> so here we go. I want to tell a story. I traveled to Senegal on a Fulbright Hayes Fellowship in 2016. 
to study the Great Green Wall of the Sahara and Sahel Initiative. This is a multinational project, an ambitious one, designed to build a wall of trees across the desert in the wake of desertification and out-migration. As a geographer, I was fascinated by the physical diversity of Senegal and the ways in which the arid landscapes of the north were in sharp contrast to the verdant wetlands of southern Senegal. Dust storms would periodically sweep across the north, signaling a dramatic start to the rainy season. In Casamance, seasonal rains would sometimes strand our team at a compound for the entire afternoon, leading to extended interviews over a plate of Yasa Jen. The peaceful coexistence between Muslims and Christians in this area is legendary. In my time spent at mosques, churches, and with African healers, brought this collaborative history to life. Fishermen sat on beaches and explained the power of gin and the everyday strategies used to keep their boats safe while at sea. And later, these same fisherfolk invited me to celebrate the Holy Muslim Day of Tabaski, where a sheep is slaughtered as part of a feast to commemorate the strength of Abraham's faith. I planted mangrove seeds in wetlands with the former minister of ecology, Idar El Ali. And because of the power of Fulbright, Idar found me before I found him. He rolled into town and said, I heard you were here. His hands-on efforts exemplify the strength of citizen science and coastal erosion to combat coastal erosion and climate change. Here, Christians and Muslims work side by side to reforest critical wetlands. Theirs is a world made by hand. But I didn't learn about the Jola humanitarian disaster until the day before I finished my fellowship. I'd been a geography professor for years, having taught courses on Africa, but I'd never read a word about the greatest humanitarian disaster to strike Senegal and the Gambia in recent years, and I was ashamed. My Senegalese partners told me that the Great Green Wall Project was a good one, but that it was the wrong one. And they told me to go home to Colorado, come back, and write a book about the Jula instead. So I came home, and I pitched the idea to our partners over at National Geographic, and they declined. So I rewrote it, pitched it again, and they declined again. But then I received a fellowship. We received a fellowship from the National Endowment, the Council for American Overseas Research Centers. And we returned to Casamance to work with Professor Eli Diada, head of the Jola Survivors Network. Built in Germany for the Republic of Senegal, the MV Jola was operated by the armed forces beginning in 1990. It was established to help fix a transportation problem rooted in what we'll call colonial cartography. That is to find a quick way around the Gambia for citizens traveling back and forth for work or school. It also allowed residents to avoid the long road through the Gambia where President Jame had been accused of human rights violations for several years and what would ultimately become decades. The Jola, represented a kind of geography of hope for many citizens. It was a 2,087-ton roll-on, roll-off ferry, what we call a row-row ferry, with a carrying capacity of 44 crew members, 536 passengers, and 35 cars. It was a beautiful ship. The victims' families and survivors I spoke with had fond memories of traveling aboard the ship, sharing food, listening to music at night, falling in love. It provided a sense of adventure not unlike the experiences of those who boarded Titanic in Southampton in pursuit of better lives. In fact, many Senegalese citizens knew well the story of the Titanic, having recently seen the epic film by James Cameron, subtitled in French. On the night of September 26, 2002, the Jola left the bustling port of Ziegenshor in the south, traveled down the Casamance River, and then turned north when it hit the Atlantic. It had nearly 2,000 passengers on board, students, mango sellers, a few dozen international tourists, mostly French, no Americans on board, 
more than three times the allowable limit. When the ship passed the small island nation, it's not a nation, the small island of Caribbean, it could be seen listing to port. Though just like other forms of transportation, it wasn't unusual for the Jola to be overloaded. Taranga, a Senegalese word taken to mean hospitality, is the spirit of generosity that pervades everyday life in Senegal. And that tenant allowed people, mostly poor people, to board the ship for free, including the 450 kids who were on board. At around 11 p.m., the ship sailed into a storm, also not unusual for that time of year in the Eastern Atlantic. But one of its engines had not been properly serviced, and within five minutes, the boat capsized, killing 1,863 people. This included Ellie's brother, Michel Diata, an athlete and a football coach, and 26 of his middle school students who perished. There were 64 survivors. One of them was female, small compared to the 600 number of women who were on board that night. Most were inside, asleep with their children. Maria Majouf was pregnant. It was her first trip on a ship, and she survived thanks to local fishing boats who served as first responders at the scene. The government failed to show up in time for a rescue. Mariama would go on to name her daughter Jola. But this is, and it isn't, a disaster narrative. There are already enough stories about Africa perpetuating the myth of the troubled continent. This is instead a testament of resistance, resilience, and hope in the face of an avoidable, predominantly black Muslim maritime tragedy that killed more people than the Titanic, yet received just a fraction of the attention. In 2022, I connected with the New York Times, and we convinced a West African-based reporter to tell the story of the Jola on its 20th anniversary. He did, which helped put the Jola on the map. But the article still fell short of highlighting the extraordinary endurance of humanitarian activists in the region. This is a sad story, but it's also steeped in hope. For 20 years, the people of Casamans have been fighting their government to raise the ship, which sits in just 60 feet of water off the coast of the Gambia, 60 feet. It's diveable. We were there last summer, honoring those who died in the wreck. Yet the Jola still has not been raised despite offers by the international community to help but survivors and their families continue to fight for restorative justice. And in December, the Jola Memorial, the structure of which is shaped like a boat with portholes, will officially open to the public in Ziegenshore as a space for contemplation in the fight against forgetting. It's no exaggeration to say that the Senegal experience changed lives. Together, we co-wrote a book. We created several story maps, one can be found through the QR code on my slide, and we started a Colorado-based podcast called Geographies of Hope in order to elevate stories of people who are getting it right despite very real but dominant dystopian narratives. There is a word for this in Wolof, a Sufi phrase called Rafat Niort. It means beautiful optimism in the face of great difficulty and tragedy. Senator Fulbright said, in closing here, perhaps the greatest power of such intellectual exchange is to convert nations into peoples, nations into peoples. And that's what we did. We did that together with our Senegalese partners, treating it as an enduring exchange rather than an extractive one-off experience. Our shared goal now is for young children, like my middle schooler, to grow up knowing the story of Africa's Jula shipwreck. And so, our work continues. Thank you, Jetta Jeff. Thank you, thank you so much, Karen. Next up, we'll have Kimberly Reyes.
We're just getting it pulled up right now. One second. Okay. Um, I'm just going to test. Okay, yeah. I might actually um, go to the pictures after. I'm going to maybe w walk you through my experience in Ireland, and then I'll show you some pictures. So I'm going to stick to this eight minutes if it kills me. Um, OK, so um, I was the 2019 through the 2020 uh, Fulbright Scholar to UCC studying Irish literature and film. Um, and I was not quite sure if I was gonna do a creative or academic Fulbright when I first applied because I'm also a published poet um, and nonfiction writer, but I finally decided to go the academic route because I was super interested in this particular master's program. Um, and everything was going really well. I was really well received in Ireland and I was able to also explore my creative writing interest because I was just like, immediately really well received by the creative community in Cork. Um, I immediately did readings um, and um, was just really welcomed by the poetry world there. Um, and my master's was going swimmingly well, like everything was like beyond perfect um, for September, October, November, December, January, February, March of 2020 happened. Um, and the world just absolutely stopped um, and library shut down. Like I, we just couldn't continue the program. Um, and basically the direction from Fulbright in DC, Fulbright in Ireland and UCC was to just go home. Um, and I already was an older student um, and I had been living in San Francisco and had like packed up my entire life to move to Ireland and was planning to stay in Ireland for like an extended amount of time. It was not like a one year program. And so I was like, home, <laughs> like home was like in a van, like it's what is home. Um, and so my option of home at the time was to like move in with my parents while I figured it out. But my parents lived in New York City, which was ground zero at the time. And I was like, there's like, no one's making me get on a plane to go to JFK right now. Like that's just not gonna happen. Um, but because I had such strong ties in the literary, literary community in Ireland, um, and I had gotten so many grants, like, it's funny if anybody um, is a writer in the United States, you know, like money and funding from the government is just not a thing. But in Ireland, like if you apply for funding, you often get it. Um, and so I had gotten a lot of scholarships and funding from the Irish government. And um, I was really tight with my professors at University College Cork. And so I had a professor who had just fled to the countryside, as many people did, um, to quarantine. And she let me have her apartment in Cork. And so I was able to stay in Ireland against like government advice and you know, Fulbright advice. Um, and because I was already so entrenched in the literary world, people were kind of like, well, you're here and you're like this random black American who's stuck in Ireland. And um, we're just wondering, like, you know, this whole thing's going on in the United States. And then, you know, like the summer came and they were like, what do you think? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, we're just kind of interested. And I had already written a lot of articles um, for the Irish press at the time. And I was like, I don't think you want to know what I think. I think I'm a visitor in a strange land and I would like not to be sent to JFK. So I'm just gonna keep my mouth shut. Um, but then I really thought about it and I thought about why I applied for the Fulbright in the first place. Um, and it was for this intercultural exchange. It was because as I wrote in my essay, I felt like um, black Americans and the Irish had so much in common when it came to colonization. And, um, you know, just, I was just sort of like, actually, like, this is why I might be here. Like, um, let's have this conversation. And I was just actually absolutely so frustrated at the time because I was living in Cork. And Cork is known as like Rebel County because of its, um, sort of like what the city represented during the Irish Re Rebellion. And, you know, I was watching all these protests happen all over the world. Um, and uh, Cork notoriously was just kind of like, not our problem, you know what I mean? Like we don't have an, a racism problem here, so we're, we're just not gonna protest. And I was like, oh, is it really not your problem? Like let's have this like conversation about racism in Ireland. And so I wrote an article that was like pretty, um, 
pretty honest, you know, about sort of like race, race relations in both Ireland and with Irish Americans and just sort of the founding of the police forces, you know, because this is again during BLM and we're having like all these conversations around policing. Um, and I was just kind of like, I like, I wrote it, I sent it out and just like was like, all right, I'm going to be deported. Um, but the reaction was actually like, people were really like sort of open to having the conversation and it sort of went viral and um, I just sort of continued to write these articles and it was just people were ready. I mean, I know it seems like really far away, but like in 2020, people were actually really to, willing to talk about race and race relations. Um, and so I just sort of kept writing and I kept my um, literary connections open and I still like, you know, I put out a book then and I just put out another book last year and I was just in Ireland promoting it last summer. Like all my connections are still very strong there and an unexpected consequence of all the writing that I did when I was living there is that, um, I don't know if you remember, but there was this whole controversy with the Hollywood Foreign Press um, in 2020 as well um, and they were looking for all these new diverse members and because I was living in Ireland and I was writing for all these Irish papers, it just so happened randomly that I qualified to become a member because I like met the criteria and I had written X amount of articles for an Irish press. And so because I was willing to be vulnerable and like sort of like write all these like really uncomfortable things, I also now go to the Golden Globes every year. Um, so like, you know, just like bonus for like, you know, sort of like taking a chance and, um, you know, telling my story, um, which was something that like I, I kind of felt like I vowed to do when I like wrote my essay to be accepted as a Fulbrighter. Um, random good things sort of happen. And I'll just show you some slides. Um, so that's me at Waterstones in Cork. Like that's like my first month there. Um, releasing my first book. Um, that's me at the bookstore at my school. And that's me um, in the Irish Times. Um, that's me in the Cork newspaper. Um, that's me actually graduating like a year later when the libraries opened. Um, and the ceremony was of course virtual. And that's me at the Golden Globes. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Kimberly. Next up, we have Anne Krylin. A fofo, Matsunigo, Vanesemawala, Sanu, Sanuda Aiki, La Hielo, Bonjour, Sava, Hola. Ni hao, ni hao ma. Hello, my name is Dr. Ann Krylin, and I am on sabbatical from my life as a wandering, wondering learner. I recently repatriated from India, where I wasn't on Fulbright, but uh, opening a school. And so it's been three months since I've come home and I'm calling on all of you for a bit of solidarity and understanding of what it's like to return to the United States of America after being away. But I'm also definitely discombobulated today after all of these amazing ideas and stories have been swirling around. And I'm feeling very honored to close this session today. So with that, Let's get down to talking about identity and this big word of otherness. Today I talk to you about the experience of being a Fulbrighter. I'll start with my own identity. I'm a Southsider from Chicago. I went to DePaul University and I started my career working for ABC Network News. I covered Columbine. And after I covered Columbine, one night I was in the feed room, and this is back when we took in things from the satellites, not through digital um, video. And I saw this night bombing, this green screen with flashes of lights, and I asked the editor, where is that? And she said, I don't know, comes in every night. 
that feed is still going. That day, I decided to leave what network news because I was tired of reporting the negative. And I wanted to go out somewhere where I didn't know where I could do some good. And thus, I joined the Peace Corps. And I was really that bright-eyed, bushy-tailed city girl who went to the only REI store in Chicagoland, which was in a strip mall. This is back in 2000. And I bought my first Swiss Army knife. It was attached to my key ring. So I was woefully unprepared to live in a mud hut with no running water, no electricity, and become a health educator. Little did I know that the identity that I was leaving of being an ABC News producer was the best decision. I had left this world that I knew was comfortable and joined and, and dove into a world of otherness. And I was no longer called Anne. I was called Anasara. Anasara is the word for foreigner in Zarma, the local language in Niger, West Africa, where I was. And it didn't matter if I was black, white, green, I was different. I was the other. And each of the countries that I have served as a Peace Corps volunteer, led international education and research as a Fulbrighter, I have come across these identifiers. I was an Anasara in Niger, Muzunga in Kenya, a Laowai in China, and a Barong in Cambodia. And these were welcome words to me because it allowed me to shed my identity here in the United States and explore a new world. And I jumped into it with excitement and zeal, and I found that I craved being an other. As a way to avoid fitting into my normative majority, skin color, nationality, and religion. And fighting my privilege, I turned to a life of public service because that's what altruism is. And I wanted to care about others. In my 20s, I was all about being the other. I do believe that Peace Corps is the best job, excuse me, the toughest job you'll ever love. And afterwards, I became an educator because of those kiddos. They were my best friends. And I found myself leading an international school in Shanghai, but I didn't give up on my passion to go do good. And I started my PhD at the University of Washington with the intention of opening schools and refugee camps. And then I fell on my head. I fell down a flight of stairs into a basement and sustained a subdermal hematoma, a traumatic brain injury, of which I lost my left ear, I cannot hear, and I lost my sense of smell which is both a blessing and a curse. And for those of you who that have been in rural villages, you'll understand why it's a blessing. So I was no longer able to choose when I wanted to be an other, but rather I was the other. I had a new identity as someone with disability and I didn't know what to make of it. I was in a place of otherness without that zeal and excitement and yearning to understand, <clears throat> excuse me, rather, I was clawing my way back to normalcy. And my journey showed me that it literally took me to fall on my head to see the world right side up. After extensive rehabilitation at the University of Washington's Medical Center, which by the way on the University of Washington campus is at the bottom of a hill, I trudged up the hill to the College of Education and slowly transitioned my way back into the world of education. But this time on the other side of the fence, special ed. And for those of you in education, I think we can all agree those are two very different worlds. I also went through, excuse me, <coughs> I also went through the gauntlet of disability 
uh, services for students. And all of us are in higher ed. And all of us know of this office. And you should get to know it really well. I learned as an educator that, wow, accommodations and modifications afforded to me through IDEA no longer applied. I was a grad student. You are an American with disability now. So I go back to academia and I rumbled with special ed and, <coughs> excuse me, disability services. And I took a summer grad class in Cambodia to look at disability through their lens. And because I was so gosh darn frustrated in America, I wanted to go someplace that actually accepted disability. So I spent six wonderful weeks in Cambodia working with kids like this one who had lost a limb due to landmines as a result of the horrific genocide led by Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge 40 years prior, leaving what was left of the population, two thirds of them disabled. This country had an understanding of disability and they had an acceptance of it because practicing Theravada Buddhism, you are born whole, but you are not broken. Thank you. You are born whole and you may lose something, but you're never broken. So one day while I was in this, I don't even know, hotel lobby, I saw a man without an arm and we started talking and I said, you lost an arm? I lost an ear, and he took his good hand and put it on my good ear, and he said, it's okay, you're one of us. I returned to the US and filled out my Fulbright application right then and there, because I was interested in finding out who I was, this new normal. Under the guise of research as an educator, because we all want to know how we understand this world. I wanted to go and find other folks who had had traumatic brain injuries, but in Cambodia, they don't recognize that. They don't understand invisible disability because it's a karmic curse. You were born that way. So here I was, afforded the opportunity to go and research and lend a voice to those with invisible disability. And I landed in the field of autism. I spent close to a year talking to families of children who were eventually diagnosed with autism. Their journeys were uphill both ways. And they involved crossing national borders to get the diagnosis, to get a definition of what autism meant because they didn't have the word, and then to find a way to go to school. The parallels of their experience trying to navigate this world of disability struck me in more ways than one in my own experience. And while their parents were eager to get, to get the answers and ask for cures from this American doctor that I supposedly was, they were more astounded that my government, the government of the United States of America, would send a female with a disability who was broken to their country to ask questions and find meaning. Uh, one mother, her request to me was, I would like you and researchers to help assist Cambodia in material and spirit to help children with disability. That ability to be a Fulbrighter was no longer my job, but rather my work. It was not becoming the other, but joining the others to try to find some mutual understanding to this world of disability. Senator Fulbright called this program a people to people program and I can't express that enough. We are Fulbrighters and we're identified as privileged, having a lot of knowledge, but more importantly, all of us are others in our own land. We have experienced something that is indescribable at times. Our job is not something to accomplish, but to carry forward 
And I hope that what I've seen today, and which carries the spirit of Peace Corps and the listening to the community first and building sustainable projects with them rather than for them, that we together continue our work as Fulbrighters. Once a Fulbrighter, always a Fulbrighter. And with that, I wish each and every one of you an incredible journey as you continue the work that we do as the Fulbrighters. Thank you.